Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar from the Poverty Task Force State of Michigan. We are so happy to um, have you here with us today. Um, my name is Kim Trent. I am the Deputy Director for Prosperity for the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. Um, one of my uh, most cherished roles in state government is serving as the key staffer to the Michigan Poverty Task Force. Um, we issued our first report, as you may know, in February of this year. And um, if you're familiar with our report, I think you know that we have used as a framing um, the state's ALICE rate. And ALICE stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, and in Employed. And um, it, is a, uh, it is a measure that has been created by the United Way. Um, here in Michigan, it's the United Ways of Michigan, have, has um, really been a great champion for the idea that we cannot measure poverty simply by um, the federal um, guidelines, that we have to really look at the lived experiences of people um, and how um, the co cost drivers uh, affect uh, really how um, far our dollars go, um, how we might have some strategies to kind of drive down those cost drivers um, and um, income, the amount of income that is coming into our families. And so um, they have done really a yeoman's effort of um, even with the um, pandemic, um, this is research that, um, although it doesn't really reflect 2020, it's um, previous to 2020, but um, even in the midst of that, they were able to really drill down, use the research that they got from the Alice report to really provide just absolutely critical data that I think that those of us who are working in this space um, can use. It's, it's very user friendly. And um, we were lucky enough, um, if you follow um, Alice, you know that um, the most recent Alice report was released by um, our Michigan United Ways in uh, March of this year. And so um, we have been partners with them in this anti-poverty work. And we wanted to give them an opportunity because um, again, our work is framed, um, which is not to say we certainly are um, looking at people who are below the Alice rate. Um, we certainly are trying to um, create our, um, our programming, our policy proposals and recommendations based on helping um, all struggling Michiganders. But um, we recognize that there's an entire class of people who at one time would have been considered um, middle class who have kind of lost their middle class status in recent years because of a number of factors, cost drivers that have made life more expensive, and then also just the lack of income that um, you're seeing for people who work every day, who um, want to have families who thrive, but who are finding themselves um, falling just a bit short. And so um, I am so pleased to be able to introduce uh, Mike Larson, who is the president and CEO um, of the uh, Michigan Association of United Ways. Mike has more than 20 years of experience with the United Way, um, providing strong, innovative, and collaborative leadership. Um, and he has a long track record with the United Way before he was the um, president and CEO of the Michigan Association. He served as the president and CEO of the United Way of Battle Creek and Kalamazoo, and also served as the president and CPO of the United Way of Greater Battle Creek from 1999 to 2008. So lots of experience at the local level and statewide level. Um, even before then, he was the executive director of the Living, Livingston County United Way um, and the vice president of the United Way of Madison County. So um, this is someone who has a lot of experience um, working with um, struggling Michiganders, working with the um, nonprofit organizations that help them every day. And um, because of that hard work, um, it has helped to manifest this really important uh, report, the Alice Report, and we wanted to give you, give Mike a platform to talk a little bit about what they found in this year's report. So, um, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Kim. I appreciate it. It is a pleasure um, to have you um, once again. I know that you actually um, joined us a few months ago when we released our Poverty Task Force report, so we thank yeah. you for joining us once again. We are hoping to have monthly um, webinars like this when we're talking about these issues that are important in our anti-poverty work. Um, and we thought that this was a really good way to launch these uh, monthly meetings 
by having you talk about the Alice report because it, it does frame so much of what we do with the Poverty Task Force. So um, with that, I know that you have a presentation and I'm happy to um, launch the PowerPoint for you now if you're ready for it. Yes, I am. Okay. Oops, Our... I have to share it first, right? <laughs> Just one second. Okay. Uh, there we go. All righty, can you see that? All right, so let's go to that that next slide, Kim. Mm -hmm. uh, Kim's gonna be my Vanna here for a second. I apologize, <laughs> Kim, so thank you for your help. Um, again, thank you uh, everybody for joining this afternoon. Um, in so many ways, we are grateful for the work that the state and Kim and the Poverty Task Force has been doing. Uh, over this period of time and how they're utilizing the Alice report um, as they focus on those major issues that prevent working, hardworking families uh, that are struggling each and every day to financial stability. So uh, the data is just tremendous and I'm glad to see that, that the state is able to utilize that to focus uh, on where they can have the greatest impact to help families and households uh, across Michigan. Um, we'll go to that slide two, if we could. <laughs> there we go. All right. So a little bit of background. Um, as Kim had mentioned earlier, my background has been with United Way for the last 29 years. Uh, and prior to coming to the Michigan Association of United Ways, I worked in local United Ways and for over 20 years as a, a local United Ways CEO. Um, and, uh, and I can just tell you in the work that United Way does at a local level, um, really targeting and focusing, how do we invest? How do we uh, leverage and bring partners to, to the table to address issues that are most important for families in need. In many cases, we are a little bit blind in how we do that. And the, the, the Alice Report has changed how we do our work and how we do our, fo our focus at a local level. The Michigan Association of United Ways represents 39 local independent United Ways across the state of Michigan. Um, their focus, they're utilizing, all of them are using the Alice uh, report to um, to look at systemic uh, ways of addressing issues in their communities. Um, they're looking and understanding disparities and targeting equity differently because of the report. Um, and it's changing the, the conversation that we have, not just with nonprofits, not just with government, but with businesses. Um, that is one of an area that, that United Way has strong relationships with many corporations and businesses in its local community. And it's changed the conversation. And, you know, when we went into it, I remember the first time I sat down with some of Fortune 500 CEOs in my community, I wasn't sure how well they were going to react because they had Alice in, they were employee Alice and how they would react. And, and every single one of them was like, oh, that is so helpful. Now we can do differently. We can do, we can look at strategies that try to help support Alice that work for us. So it's changing the conversation even for our corporate partners. Um, and it's, we're looking at, you know, removing barriers and supporting systemic solutions. So let's uh, move on to the next slide if we could. So I, I'm gonna assume that not everybody knows the Alice report. So I'm gonna do a little bit of 101 Alice if that's okay. As Kim had mentioned, the acronym is Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. It's our working poor, those people that are above the federal, federal poverty level, uh, but below the household survival budget. And I'll talk a little bit of that over here on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, we're talking about low wage jobs. Um, you know, examples are cashiers, um, security guards, office administration. Um, this is, no savings. People are, they don't have enough money each month to put anything away. So nothing for emergencies. So when the car breaks down and they can't get to work, what happens? Um, also some, some key terms that's good for people to understand because you're going to hear me talk about this throughout the presentation. Um, household survival budget. This is the bare minimum cost of basic necessities and just around housing, childcare, food, transportation, healthcare, and a smart 
foam plan. The ALICE threshold is the average income needed to afford the household survival budget. Households below the ALICE threshold include both ALICE and poverty level households. So it's good that you understand it's both ALICE and poverty level. And then ALICE, as we talked about already, and then poverty households earnings below the federal poverty level, and then total households, the number of households as reported by the American Community Survey. Go to the next slide. So what's new in this report? Because this is not our first report. As, as Kim mentioned, we just released the newest report in March. Um, there are some, some new changes to it, the methodology. And I'm not going to go into the detail of this. Uh, you can go to our, uh, and I'm going to share the link to the website where you can get to all this detail. But there's more local variation, uh, more variations by household size. And in two new measures, which is really nice to this, is the senior survival budget and then the Alice Essentials Index, which are two key uh, pieces that you'll see used uh, in the presentation today, but it's really been well-developed and you'll, you'll be able to utilize that in the, uh, the, the, uh, the virtual site. Um, also, the website has added a number of new graphs, graphs and maps. Uh, it's, uh, it is a tremendous resource. I really, Typically, we actually do a little demo of it. We're not going to be doing that today. I'd really encourage you to go to the website and look. There is so much data that you can pull and, and actually um, utilize for yourself for different things you're using all the way down from county, state, county, down to a local level uh, that you'll be able to utilize. Okay, Kim. So what are we seeing? What are the trends that we're starting to see? Cost of living for Alice households, that Alice Essential Index um, is you know, at 3.4% versus uh, uh, the, um, excuse me, Consumer Price Index. And um, what, I, what we're seeing right now, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but the Alice Essential Index is looking at just those basic needs are actually growing in cost at a greater rate than just the consumer price index is growing. So there's a disparity here, which is creating a real challenge for Alice households. Um, worker vulnerability. Uh, many are seeing fluctuating in hours, schedules, benefits, while wages are just staying stagnant uh, in many cases. And then the number of Alice households, what we're seeing, um, poverty, from 2007 to 2019, um, around 13%. And it, you're gonna see where that's kind of stayed flat over that period of time. What, what we are seeing is an in increase in Alice. So from uh, 2007, 19% to 2019, we're at 25%. So we're seeing, uh, we're seeing growth in this area where we don't want to. We're really trying to focus on that. So next slide. So Alice in Michigan, 38% um, of Michigan households had income below the Alice threshold, meaning they were unable to afford the even the most basic needs. So poverty at 13%, Alice increased from uh, uh, over 740,000 in 2007 to over a million in 2019. And then the other piece that I think is really important that was a new piece to the report this year, as we, as we looked at household incomes and looked at that income bracket just above uh, the Alice threshold, what, we have 10% of households on the cusp of Alice threshold in 2019. This is a tipping point. And this is what concerns me as I look at, because these numbers are pre-COVID. So think about how COVID is now impacting Alice as a whole, especially these families uh, that, that were at that tipping point of struggling. We're gonna, I'm gonna assume we're gonna start to see a number of families uh, falling down into the Alice uh, threshold piece. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, also in this report, we, 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 we spent more time focused on the demographics, household demographics. And there's a couple of slides that we're going to show here. 
Um, but I think this is a very telltale sign of where we have some real disparities and challenges. So the dark blue dots are below the Alice threshold, the yellow dots or the orange dots would be above the threshold. And what you're seeing here, and, and one that stands out immediately to me is single fe female headed households. You'll see two, two dots out of three. <laughs> Actually, we're, we're close to 75% of single female headed households in Michigan are below the Alice threshold. Um, and many people in, on this call, I'm sure, would not be surprised in that. I think the other disparities that you start to see is start looking at like our black households. Um, we've got 60% of black households uh, that are below the ALS threshold. So I'm gonna go, just go ahead and move us to the next slide because it, it, it'll give it a little bit more specific. So it'll, it'll actually show you around the Hispanic population, the black population, um, those under 25 years old, um, and, uh, and then all households to give you kind of a breakdown. And the number, the total households that fall within that is significant. So um, as we look at a bare minimum budget, and I know sometimes this might be hard to see on this graph, but I'm gonna take you over here to the graph on the right-hand side. And what it does is it breaks down by household, Where'd we go? We just bounced. Did I jump? There we go. Thank you, Kim. So as we look at a, uh, on the right-hand side, look at household survival budget for a family of four. So monthly total of $5,343. And look at the breakdown of what those costs are uh, for a family. Again, there's no savings in here, folks. This is just a breakdown for basic needs cost. And some of these, uh, actually, uh, you know, one of them has been out front and center here lately is around child care. Um, but for a family of four, we're looking at $1,122. And as you can see, it's the highest percentage of cost in their, their monthly budget is child care. Um, a total annual total need just to meet this is $64,116. Just to give you a little bit of background of what it takes just to meet that need. Um, and then we, we, you'll see these lines that we put in here and that's, that's, uh, um, that's the Federal CARES Act stimulus check that we're, uh, individuals receive. So individuals uh, received 1,200 and then a family household received $3,400. So you can see that it didn't even touch what the basic needs was uh, um, on a monthly basis uh, for families. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So as I mentioned before, uh, we talked about the Alice Essential Index and, and this just kind of, this graph just helps give you a little bit more perspective of what we've seen. So if you go back to 2007, um, we looked at, we're looking at the growth of just the basic household Alice uh, needs and what, what they're looking at. And, and it's a 3.4% increase over time um, versus the uh, consumer price index of 1.8%, but it's a significant divide in what we're seeing here. And we have struggling families that are uh, working hard to figure out how they make that difference up. And I'd be very interested because what we're seeing right now uh, in the middle of COVID is uh, significant increases in basic needs as well. We're all seeing that. So uh, I think this next report is gonna reflect some even more significant growth in the uh, Alice Essential Index um, graph here. We'll move to the next slide. So wages versus household survival budget. So the, the uh, dark blue line represents uh, job cannot support family household survival budget with two earners. So um, I think the, the piece that, uh, that stands out to me is as you go into, if you look around 2010, um, we're going to see uh, where that significant growth was 
uh, of those individuals who couldn't support uh, households of two. And, and then you're also seeing that, because this was in the, um, as we looked at the, the great recession that hit us in 2009 and 2010, that reflects the changes. So the decrease in um, minimum wage jobs and in high wage jobs. Um, and slowly, some of those are ticking up uh, as we've gotten to 2019. Um, but at the same time, uh, we're not seeing uh, the, you know, we're still seeing fairly flat level uh, around those who can't support themselves um, and are within that Alice threshold piece. So the changing landscape of work. Um, so I, I think it's good for people to first off understand what we mean by full-time. Full-time represents 35 hours per week, just to kind of give you some background uh, to the slide. Um, and I think it's also good to, to know that more than half of jobs here in Michigan were hourly paid in 2019. Um, only 25% of working age adults had the security of a full-time job with a salary. 38% um, were out of the labor market. So you'll see on the graph to the right, 18% uh, not in labor force uh, retired. 20% um, not in labor force, some are not working. I think this number is probably a little bit higher uh, today in the middle of COVID. Uh, this could be students, um, college students or so on. But, uh, and then we're looking at 24% um, you know, full-time hourly, 8% part-time hourly, 3% uh, part-time salary. So it just kind of gives you a breakdown uh, what this looks like by our population. And these are um, age 16 and over. We'll go to our next slide. This slide, um, this is really more of just as a think piece. So thinking outside the box, thinking what if, what if. So if you took the current, it, it, what you'll see is this, is this is a look at if we had all of our Alice households above the Alice threshold everybody, all households above the Alice threshold. And the top graph gives you an idea of our current situation in 2019, where 38% uh, of households below the Alice threshold, earnings were 31.8 billion. And if you took the idea uh, that uh, all, all households were above, we'd see an, an additional earnings of 36.5 billion. And then that would multiply and increase consumer spending. Um, and you'd see potentially 80.4 billion there. Uh, it also would touch the tax revenue. Currently right now, Alice is, uh, in, uh, has 1 billion impact on the state's tax revenue. That could potentially increase, it, increase that to 1.7 billion. Um, and then community spending, uh, the impact that that could have as well. But if you were to multiply all those, and again, this is a hypothetical situation, but the reality is if we could get people um, to financial stability in our state, it helps us all. It helps everyone. It helps the whole state um, move forward. So uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's something to, to think big. And I think this is exactly what United Ways are focused on is trying to move the needle for households out of poverty to financial stability because we know uh, if they're financially stable, they're going to be more successful in life as a whole. And I think that's the commitment from the Poverty Task Force as well. So the, the last page, I just want to um, highlight um, the, the website. I'd encourage you uh, to write that down. Take some time to go that in and spend some time um, working through that because we have interactive maps that will give you data. Uh, you can group it in different ways um, and, and it, you'll find it as a, a significant resource uh, for the work that you're doing and other organizations and individuals that are doing work at a local and a state level. So um, I won't go into detail, but that just kind of highlights some of the things that it does. So. I'm going to stop there. I probably didn't give enough time for Q&A, but I will open that up for Kim. 
No, that was that was perfect, Mike. Thank you so much. Um, no, I, I think that you um, gave us just exactly what we needed with um, the limited time that we have. So we appreciate your um, sharing um, some context about the report. I'm just wondering, um, can you give us a sense of how Michigan compares to maybe our other Great Lakes states or, um, you know, just in the national picture, where does Michigan fall um, with our Atlas rate? I'm going to turn that over to my colleague, Nancy Lindman, because I know she's working with the national group. So Nancy, you there? Sure. Michigan's right in the middle of the pack. We're 26 nationally in terms of the number of households below the threshold. Got it. Um, so uh, we, we talked a little bit about um, cost drivers. And one of the things that you mentioned um, was um, child care. And I know that that's a space that United Way has been really interested in. And certainly um, Governor Whitmer and um, kind of the work that we're doing both in the executive office and here in Leo to expand um, you know, accessibility, uh, affordability um, for, um, for childcare. We saw um, some people have actually called this, this um, kind of the results of um, the COVID economy a, a she session rather than recession because so many women um, still are hesitating to re-enter the workforce because of childcare being an issue. Um, can you talk a little bit about just how important that is as a cost driver um, for Alice families? I mean, you, I know you talked about that a little bit in your presentation, but um, what kind of work are you doing with United Ways to, um, you know, kind of take a look at childcare, to partner with um, kind of local United Ways that are working with you know, local governments, what, what, how do we solve this problem? What are some of the solutions that you think have some, um, that could be helpful um, to help but, us address that problem? Yeah, it, it's a significant issue and it's it's been an issue for a very long time, um, but it, it's becoming even uh, more significant right now. What we're seeing is United Ways are, are looking at, um, it, it, the key is we need, uh, accessible, affordable, and quality. Um, all those pieces are critical for a child to be successful moving forward. So we're using that data to help drive the conversations with not just our partners, our nonprofits who are doing the work. Because you know one of the biggest challenges we have right now is many of our, our child care providers are Alice. Um, they're struggling themselves. So first and foremost, um, most of our child care providers don't they don't have the resources they need to be sustainable themselves. So looking at how do we make sure that we, we that they have the resources they need to be able to do that. Um, accessibility is key for families. You know, you, you don't have the ability to drive a half hour to drop a child off to child care. So making sure it's available. These are conversations that we're having with our business partners. They're looking at, they see that this is a, a barrier for employees to get to work. So there's, there's really unique, creative conversations happening at local levels that, that's inclusive of nonprofits and business partners to create solutions around creating accessibility and affordability uh, around these types of things. But it's, it's bigger than what's happening at a local level. We know that there are barriers for families that are just above that tipping point of being able to get um, uh, you know, state resources to support that. I mean, I own, I had an employee myself that I tried to increase her salary and give her growth, but she had five kids and she goes, Mike, I want this job. I want to take it to the next level, but I can't because I lose my state support around this, my childcare. I can't do it. We got to think how we do that. So it really allows households and, and families and mothers to be able to, to, to advance themselves. I'm so glad that you mentioned that um, because um, one of the recommendations that we had in the poverty task force report is addressing benefits cliffs. So the exact situation that you just described where um, you know, really talented people who um, their bosses recognize that they um, should earn more compensation and have more responsibility are not able to take that you know, raise and pay because they don't want to jeopardize their benefits particularly for things like childcare and healthcare. So um, that's something that I do feel optimistic because there seems to be 
um, some momentum on both sides of the aisle that we will be able to um, accomplish from the poverty task force report. Um, there seems to be, um, I know that that has been an issue for United Way. And I also wanna kind of go back to when you talked about how um, business leaders seem to understand how important it is to um, really kind of engage in this conversation about childcare because it's starting to affect their bottom lines in some ways because of their inability to attract talent in some ways or, or retain talent. Um, I wanna just also lift up the fact that um, one of the pilots that we have here in the state of Michigan right now is a, a program we have called TriShare. Um, we have a pilot that's happening right now in Northwest Michigan, one in Muskegon and one in Saginaw. And we're looking at maybe even expanding it beyond those pilots um, to, uh, that would allow someone who wants to um, have access to childcare, um, their employer would, would pay one third of the childcare cost the state of Michigan would pay a third, and then that employee employee would pay a third. We really see it as a talent attraction tool, in addition to helping solve, you know, a major problem of affordability for um, our, um, you know, for our workers who really do rely on childcare. So those that kind of creative solutions, um, those kind of creative solutions are the kind of partnerships that you just described um, at the local level that you're seeing with your your local um, United Way. So mm -hmm. I'm so happy that. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the one great thing out of both your report and my report is it's an opportunity to um, launch some discussions about solutions. I mean, it's one thing to point out the data, but really to come up with some innovation so that we can solve the problems, I think is, is really a, a great um, goal of, um, of the Alice report. So we thank you for that. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, you know, again, kind of going back to cost drivers, um, home um, home ownership and, and housing, because I know that um, what we have found on the state level, when I go out and talk about the poverty task force report, um, by far, the number one thing that I hear over and over again is that there's a lack of affordable housing um, in our state. And I know that our, um, uh, that MISHTA is now embarking on a statewide housing plan. Um, I don't, I know how, I, I know, I'm sure that they're um, bringing some of your best brains to the table as they um, work on that project. But um, have you seen uh, the cost of housing um, obviously is a major cost in anyone's budget, um, but for kind of lower income Michiganders, I'm assuming that that's um, a major issue um, as you kind of tr think about how people end up in kind of the Alice category where they're, they're barely uh, making ends meet. Housing impacts um, families that are struggling in so many different ways, other than just the housing piece. Um, you know, I had a had a conversation with my one of my local United Way CEOs a couple of years ago, and and he said, you know, our our Alice numbers are not as bad as everybody else, but the reason they're not as bad is because we don't have any affordable housing, so it forces Alice outside of our county and they have to drive in to work each and every day. He said they can't even afford to live in our community. And so when you think about how that, that issue right there multiplies the challenge for an Alice household. So now to get a, a decent job, I gotta figure out transportation to get outside into a county. I gotta manage uh, a, you know kids going to school that are far away from me that might have issues. I mean, there's so many challenges that are created around um, housing um, in, for, for families. And you, we have a number of our United Ways that are working with, uh, uh, you know, government, community, local governments, um, uh, townships, um, working with uh, corporate partners and nonprofits to find different strategies that we can. I was just listening to the news uh, today in uh, Kalamazoo and it sounds like uh, that, that Kalamazoo might even be looking at some of their, the relief dollars that they're getting is like, so how do we create more affordable housing in the Kalamazoo area? I, I'm hoping that's the type of things that, that our local uh, communities are looking at as strategies to do that. That's great. Um, can you tell us, Mike, just um, as you saw the data that came in with your report this year, year, what was the thing that you found most surprising? Was there anything that just stood out for you that you um, didn't anticipate? Or do you think we've 
kind of been on the same track for a while and it's just more of what you've seen in, in previous reports. Well, I, I think, you know, I, I think what has happened is, is it gets more detail and gets into more data. It helps us better understand things. I myself have been seeing these trends continue, but I, as we can dive deeper into it, it helps us better un understand. So, you know, just like seniors and the senior budget and the challenges, I, I mean, I, I look at my own parents and I see the challenges they face. But I don't know the data. Now we're starting to see the data and what that survive that budget looks like mm -hmm. and the challenges that they're facing. So it helps us be more better at. So what what solutions can we create to support seniors? Um, it's those types of things that are helping. You know, I think uh, um, understanding how cost increases in costs are are impacting families helps us start to think and project out. Since this is 2019 data, I think it helps us think and better prepare ourselves for what we're dealing with now, because we know that that's only going to grow. So what are, what are things that we can learn from back in the recession that's gonna help us be more proactive as we go into the recovery stage of COVID? Um, in our state. But uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say there was one single thing. It's just, I, I just, as we could dive deeper into the data, I'm like, oh, wow, that makes sense. Um, that brings more clarity to why um, families are challenged there. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, what do you think, uh, how would you recommend that stakeholders, I mean, and I think a lot of the people on this call are people who work with um, you know, Alice population or even, you know, even lower income than Alice um, every day. Um, how would you recommend, what are some of the uses that they can, um, you know, how can they use this, this data to make a difference um, in the work that they do every day? Well, I think it starts with informing yourself. So I, I would first and foremost is encourage you, as I did earlier, um, get on the website and, and, and start to dive a little bit deeper into the data. Um, data helps inform you first. It helps you understand what that needs. It helps educate you and gives you a voice around what that need is, that need is and gives you the data to support that. Um, I think it's the other opportunity is be the voice for Alice. Um, in your work at each and every day, that's what you do. And I think uh, the more we can utilize this, not just with uh, within the, our work, but how we talk about this outside. Um, we're actually, I mean, our, our whole public policy focus for, for United Ways is focused around Alice. Um, we really have to really, the, the goal is to get this message out and help people understand. The more people are informed, they're, and I will say, I, in most cases, people are so receptive to data. Um, you know, it's not polarizing uh, in, in as other issues might be. So, um, utilizing this data is going to be key to support the work that you're doing. Okay. Um, I have a question from Kevin Ford, um, who is um, watching us now. Um, she, he's asking, um, with such high Alice numbers among single family, I mean, single female headed households, are there strategies to address fathers and the role of fathers in family well-being? Um, you know, I, I'm going to also utilize Nancy in this. I would say that there, there are in many cases. Um, um, I know that in just in my work that, that we've been doing in local United Ways over my years, there was uh, quite a bit of focus just on um, single family households uh, that were uh, with, with men. So I think at the same time, there's a balance here. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure why that data doesn't show specifically that because my guess is that it might not be as high because of the income might be a little bit higher for men, but the reality is many of the same challenges exist um, uh, there as well. Nancy, do you have any, any thoughts on that? No, I think that's right. It, it, it's pointing out a little disparity between moms and dads and probably income. Um, the income assessment. Right. Um, I know from the state's perspective, I mean, there are some things that we're trying to do um, to support families and to acknowledge the role that, um, you know, certainly that fathers play. And, and one thing that um, we have uh, tried to do, um, for example, with, uh, for non-custodial um, parents, right now, uh, the way that our system is set up is that if a 
non-custodial parent who's paying child support, if their um, custodial parent um, is uh, receiving benefits for that child, uh, whatever money people pay into the child support actually goes to uh, the state first to reimburse for those um, benefits. And we have really called for in the um, poverty task force report, a pass through so that those dollars, if, if a parent is so invested in um, his or her child, even if they're not custodial, that they are paying their child support, really those funds should go to the child and not to reimburse the state. Um, because a lot of those money at, um, a lot of that money is really, I think, um, you know, federal money that's coming to us anyway. So, um, you know, that's one of the that's one of the ideas that we had in the poverty task force. And, you know, I'm sure that we're working with our local um, United Ways who work every day with um, both nonprofit organizations and individuals um, who are invested in this work um, to help both um, you know, mothers and fathers, families in general. But um, in those kind of cases where, um, you know, the, the there's a barrier in the way that our laws are written that actually prevent families from being able to thrive as much as they, they could. Um, just one other question from the audience that I wanted to raise is um, from Lisa Whitmore Davis, who's asking, um, how will this data impact how we support our older adults, specifically um, the many ad older adults who are um, raising small children, which is kind of a um, challenge that we know seniors, um, a lot of seniors in our communities are, are finding themselves being parents for the second time. Um, how does this data um, impact or how, how can we use this data to help those kinds of um, seniors? Well, I think first and foremost, by being more um, focused on seniors in this report uh, gives uh, all of us and local United Ways um, the data that it needs to look at strategies to help seniors. Um, specifically, you're, you're absolutely right. We have, we have a lot of seniors who are raising another family in many cases, uh, which adds a significant financial burden on a fixed income household. Um, and uh, so uh, I think all of those specific things are being looked at. Um, I, I, I don't know, if, Nancy, if you have any other specific things that we could share uh, that we know of that's happening, but I think the, what, what I really like about this is the data is starting to get more intentional around showing and identifying the challenge that we see here. Yep, I think that's right. Take a look at the interactive map, pull down the senior map, and you'll see higher levels of Alice. It is significant. So we've got the data to advocate. And you know, I think one of the most harmful stereotypes that people have about poverty is that it's something that's an urban phenomenon. And we know from um, this report that that is not the reality. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, just kind of the rural challenges that you that this report kind of teases out? Um, what kind of challenges they're facing with employment? What kind of challenges they're facing with kind of cost drivers? Um, I think you mentioned one example of people um, aren't able to even afford to live in the central city of their county. They have to live in rural areas because they can't afford to live. Um, yeah, and that's that's very true. And if you if you were to go just go north, uh, you'll find some of our highest percentage of Alice populations are in our rural communities, where you would have kind of assumed it might be just our urban settings. The reality is, is many of our rural communities do not have uh, employers that pay well or significant employee options to be able to uh, make the level of income that they need to be above the, um, the ALS threshold. So um, there's just not accessibility. In many cases, they're traveling further uh, to work. Um, so there's a lot of those types of challenges that exist uh, for many people in our rural communities. Okay, well, um, Mike, I, I thank you so much for sharing this information about um, about the, the ALICE report. I think it has been um, very useful to us as we've been um, planning here in the state of Michigan. We have a unique opportunity um, and challenge because of the ARPA dollars that are coming in. How do we invest those one-time dollars in a way that's meaningful so that we can you know, kind of address the structural challenges that we face that um, yeah. have created um, poverty? 
um, or have, have expanded the number of Alice um, households in our, our state. Um, even as the, the poverty number actually has waned, we have seen the Alice number expand. And so, um, you know, we we, I think it's important for us to be intentional about um, really addressing how we can help um, move that population back into the middle class. Um, we have a number of strategies. Uh, one of the things that the governor is very passionate about is the um, our 60 by 30 initiative where we're trying to get 60% of Michigan um, working Michiganders or, um, you know, working age Michiganders to um, get a post-secondary uh, credential. Uh, we know that uh, the jobs of the future, the jobs of the 21st century require that kind of training. The, the days when um, my grandparents, both of my grandfathers were able to graduate from high school and go straight into the plant, make really great careers and have, um, you know, the, the house up north and the second car sometimes and all of those accoutrements that we had um, back in the day when you didn't really need to have that second second post-secondary credential, you know, those days are over. Um, so we're trying, you know, we have our Futures for Frontliners um, program that rewarded those brave men and women who uh, worked on the front lines of our economy at a time when a lot of us had the luxury of working from home. You know, the people who were um, still staffing the gas stations and the, uh, you know, cleaning our hospitals and stocking our grocery shelves and all those things that still had to be done even in the midst of a pandemic um, offering them an opportunity to get access to um, college tuition, offering our, um, you know, our um, Michigan Reconnect program that gives um, Michiganders over the age of 25 who want to go back to school access to um, tuition. We are so, um, you know, really passionate about um, trying to get people so that they are able to have higher income um, so that we won't have the same level um, of Alice population. We want people to comfortably pay their bills. We want people to have economic mobility. Um, we're trying to remove those barriers and we know that you are also at United Way. So we thank you for not only measuring where we are, but really engaging in the work to change where we are. And um, with that, um, I thank everyone who has joined us for this uh, webinar. We will be back with you again next month for a, an important issue about um, poverty in the state of Michigan. And um, thank you for joining us today. We will see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.